Celiac disease is a digestive condition triggered by the consumption of the protein gluten, which is primarily found in bread, pasta, cookies, pizza crust, and many other foods containing wheat, barley, or rye. Those who are diagnosed with the disease therefore have to avoid foods such as beers, breads, cakes and pies, candies, cereals, cookies, gravies, oats, pastas, salad dressings, sauces, and soups. Celiac disease is an immune-mediated reaction to gluten which occurs in genetically predisposed individuals. The research goal of this study was to explore the incidence and prevalence of celiac disease as a means of understanding the recent gluten-free bakery food trend. Literature and personal interviews also examined connections between the gluten-free, dairy-free diet and autism, in addition to evaluating such specialized bakeries in terms of their approaches to both cost and taste. When I was a baby, at one years old, they were afraid that I was going to die because I refused to eat. And the doctor, the pediatrician, actually told my mother, just keep putting food in front of her and let her eat with her hands and eventually she'll eat. But I was, I was severely underweight and I wouldn't eat. From that point on, I had stomach issues, constant ear infections, and they never made the correlation, but the inflammation caused, you know, first of all, gluten is an inflammatory. Mm -hmm. Inflammation causes disease. So because I was having issues with gluten, I constantly had ear infections because I had such inflammation in my ears, which caused, you know, which caused all of these infections. I had tonsillitis all the time. I had stomach bloating, the skin rashes, everything. When I was 16, I went from the time I was 16 till the time I was 20, I had more medical procedures than you can imagine, trying to figure out what was wrong with me. Of course, my whole high school years, I worked at a pizza parlor. So, oh my God. <laughs> That didn't help, but I mean, they were doing upper GIs, lower GIs, scans, you name it, for four years, and finally they said, you have irritable bowel syndrome, eat poached chicken and white rice. Well, good luck telling a 20-year-old that and having her stick to it. Um, I did remove dairy from my diet as a teen, and that did help, because I'm one of, you know, I'm someone with celiac disease who also cannot do any dairy whatsoever. And there's about 50% of people with celiac disease, that's the issue. Mm -hmm. um, but then, two years later, that whole time I was also going literally from one gynecologist to another because I had such severe, severe problems with my reproductive system. And at 22, I was diagnosed with stage 4 endometriosis, which is also an autoimmune disorder. And they say with celiac disease, it it so compromises your, your immune system that you will develop other autoimmune diseases and endometriosis is an autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. So at 22 I thought, well, IBS, stage four endometriosis, that seems to make sense in terms of why I'm having so many, so many issues. So I went through life just accepting the fact that that's what I had to deal with and that's what the symptoms were, um, when in fact it was the root cause of the problem with celiac disease. I think we're definitely seeing a lot more of patients with the gluten intolerance, uh, the celiac disease, mm -hmm. the entire complex that we see. And I think it's more because that we are more aware of it. I, not, not, I don't think it's just the incidence suddenly shot up, but we are more aware and then we are evaluating these patients more so for that particular entity than we did before. A lot of times in the past, none of this was available. We didn't know what they were having. Mm -hmm. And we just kind of didn't make the connection that it was a celiac disease that these patients were having and that they need to be on a gluten-free diet completely. Yeah. And, and that is something. So in that sense, incidence-wise, I don't know whether we can tell that what, what the true incidence is, but 
People claim that anywhere from uh, for about 130 to 135, one in 133 to one in 135 people have have celiac disease. So okay. that's, so it's, it's pretty pretty prevalent in that particular way. But but once again, the diagnosis is becoming something that we're becoming more aware of, more conscious of, both at the primary care level, at the gastroenterologist, and as well as the allergist as well. The bakery started three and a half years ago, but I had been baking all my life. I had a career in financial services for 20 years. But every time I traveled, and I traveled extensively every time I came home, took off the soup, went in the kitchen, and started to bake, and that was my stress relief. So, every once in a while I'd say to my husband, I really want to ditch the career and open a bakery. And he'd say things like, do you know how many cakes you'd have to bake to make the type of living you make now? However, my husband passed away nine years ago, and when he passed away, I decided that the next chapter of my life would be doing things that I enjoy doing. So, I went back to school to become a pastry chef, and was working in the industry for four years, when I just kept getting sicker and sicker and sicker. Is this something that you've seen more in kids, more in adults, or is this widespread throughout different groups of people? Well, it's definitely much more in adults than it is in children. Definitely okay. much more, at least of what I have seen. You know? mm -hmm. And I practice both you know, pediatric allergies as well as adult allergies. So I see the entire gamut of people is much, much more prevalent in, in, in adults than it is in children. Hey? And maybe it's my personal bias in, in my practice that I've seen, women te seem to be having much more of an incidence of having this than men. So that, mm -hmm. is, that is what I've seen. So adult women are more likely to develop that is what I have seen in the practice. So after making all of these changes in my life, my option was to either leave the industry again and decide what I would do next or rediscover how to work in this industry. So the next day I went out and bought all types of gluten-free products, hated all of them, threw them all away and <laughs> said, this is a business. So I spent the next four months, seven days a week, trying to learn how to bake gluten-free. So I read more things than you can imagine, um, learning about the different the different flowers that are gluten-free and how they react and it was really a chemistry test and my naturopath um, offered to have her office as a tasting center so every day I would bake and I would go to my naturopath's office and deliver goods and all of her patients would taste them and then they would come back and say like this I would like this different, and that's how it all began. So I started with a handful of tasters, and by the time I was finished four months later, I had over 200 families that I was delivering product to to get their feedback. Along the way, not only did I learn that I needed to be gluten-free, and I also was dairy-free, which is typical of many celiac patients, um, but I kept getting feedback about all of these other allergies that people had, soy allergies, peanut allergies, tree nut allergies, egg allergies. So when we opened the business um, in November of 2008, we were a gluten-free, dairy-free, soy-free, peanut-free bakery. It's funny because no one was ever allergic to soy before. Soy is the second largest genetically modified crop in the United States. No surprise that about five years after we started genetically modifying soy, all of these allergies developed. Because our bodies see genetically modified food as a poison. Everything you see is done with organic plant-based food coloring. So we don't use any of the chemical food colors. One is red and it's actually beet juice. Wow. Um, the yellow is made from cardamom, and the blue is made from kale and cabbage. In terms of the taste, you know how you said you got feedback. Um, it, well, in your opinion, is there a, lot, a big difference between what a gluten-free, say, cupcake would taste like in comparison to a normal cupcake? And 
our customers say they taste better. Okay. So, uh -huh. and and I believe that's because we're baking from scratch in small batches. Mm -hmm. So it's really about the quality of the ingredients that we're using that makes such a quality product. So much of what you see nowadays is just, it's filled with chemicals, it's, you know, they're not high quality products starting out. So you're not mm -hmm. going to have the same flavor profile with the end result. 90% of our ingredients are organic. So we're using the very best ingredients to begin with, and I think that's why customers love our product. And in terms of cost, because it must be more expensive to go this route. It's far more expensive. Okay, all right. Um, refined sugar commercially costs about 50 cents a pound. Um, my, when I use organic agave nectar, wholesale, that's $10 a pound. Wow. So there's a difference. Mm -hmm. um, refined white sugar, again, even compared to organic evaporated cane juice, I'm paying $3 a pound wholesale versus $0.50 cents a pound. So our costs range anywhere from, you know, three times more in cost, 300% more to 1,000% more. Um, and yet, it's not reflected in the prices. Yes, our prices are more expensive than a traditional bakery, um, but not 10 times more compared to our, the difference in our costs. Wheat in the United States is very, very cheap. It's our largest crop. And it has typically been subsidized by the US government, where the flours used in our bakery um, you know, are made they're grown by small farmers. It's not subsidized by the United States. It's not a large, you know, it's not manufactured in large, large quantity. So they're kind of like boutique flowers, and as a result, they cost so much more. When examining celiac disease in the context of society and the global market, one notes that the number of individuals embracing a gluten-free diet exceeds the projected number of celiac patients. The global market trends show that gluten-free product sales are up to $2.5 billion. This trend supports the notion that other diseases related to the ingestion of gluten have emerged as health concerns as well, and this accounts for that difference in numbers. Michelle Pietzak's article titled, When Gluten-Free is Not a Fad, states, in contrast to just a decade ago when gluten-free was associated with rice cakes that tasted like styrofoam and dry crumbling bread products, today's gluten-free diet is perceived as both healthy and tasty. The gluten-free diet has been embraced by the general public because it's now seen as a fad diet. This is so because it's considered a medical and nutritional therapy for several conditions such as celiac disease as mentioned and also neurological conditions such as gluten-sensitive ataxia and autism. The inability to process gluten or casein is proposed to exacerbate or result in autism. Casein is the protein of all forms of dairy, and it's the combination of the two that for some reason um, helps with autism. So it can't just be gluten-free, it must be gluten-free and casein-free for it to work. Furthermore, studies have revealed that a gluten-free and casein-free diet reduce the autistic traits of social isolation and bizarre behavior in those children or adults that have been diagnosed with the condition. In your experience, have you seen that there's been more of an effort in terms of gluten-free bakeries and things like that in our absolutely, area? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And I think what, what, is, what we are getting better at is how we label our products. And so, so people are aware that, you know, that yes, it is in a bakery where, you know, that you know, gluten could have been reused inadvertently. Mm -hmm. And so you don't want to make that mistake, even though your particular product may not have gluten in that. So I think the labeling has definitely improved significantly, number one, even in general marketing. So anywhere and everywhere you go, you have the option. And, you know, therefore the likelihood of making mistakes is reduced because the labeling is there, number one. Mm -hmm. That is in general. 
available. And then obviously we have this wonderful niche of bakeries that have you know cropped up all over. You know, and sometimes you're around the corner and sometimes you may have to drive a little bit to get there and then you find that you can definitely you really do not have to necessarily restrict yourself if you go to the right places and get the right food. It may be a little more expensive than what you find at other places in terms of bakeries, but I think then the option is you cannot eat that at all, or you can eat it in some different form of it. And I think people will, will tend to go and, and, and visit these bakeries and enjoy the foods they can eat now.